Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. My guest today is assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at Harvard University. Yawen Lei is author of the new Princeton University volume, The Contentious Public Sphere, Law, Media, and Authoritarian Rule in China. Lei investigates the emergence of public opinion across China, the intersection of media, particularly the internet, law, and society. How has the Chinese state responded to citizen actors and to the aspiration of free speech across the country? Those are the questions we'll ask today. Lei writes, after a post-Tiananmen decline, public opinion began to rise again around 1998, thanks to the key role of state-controlled, marketized newspapers in facilitating the formation of increasingly unruly public opinion, capable of escaping state control to set the public agenda. She concludes, the rising support for anti-system populist nationalists in Europe and the United States seems to indicate the decline of liberal democracy and its decreasing moral appeal as a political model in the West, prompting Chinese actors to rethink and compare difference in political and developmental models. That's precisely what we'll address today. Thank you, Professor, for joining me. Thank you for inviting me. And, you know, in the response to that unruly public opinion, you write about the nature of cyber sovereignty in the book, um, that China has managed to contain the public sphere within its own cyber security, safe spaces. Right. How, how have they been able to do that? Uh, because the Chinese government consider an um, issue related to public um, sphere as a domestic issue. So they don't want to have, I mean, intervention from other foreign countries. And um, China also, I mean, in the beginning of um, the development of Internet, China already invented a lot of very high technology to really um, impose censorship. So and in addition to technology, the Chinese government has also established a lot of legal regulations to regulate people's speech. So with the help of law and also technology, the Chinese government has been able to control, um, to a large extent, speech on the Internet. From the perspective mm. of the U.S., it's interesting to think about the Chinese Internet experience looking at the net neutrality situation. Mm -hmm. To what extent are the Chinese government in operation with, sort of in concert with, the Chinese economic business community mm -hmm. sheltering the Internet in this way? Could they? Could they manage to do it just as a state actor, or, or do they have a lot of help doing that? Um, the Chinese government um, has help from corporations. So a lot of actually U.S. companies like Google and Facebook want to do business with the Chinese, um, with um, China, right? And then the Chinese government always told them that they need to follow legal regulations in China. And then the Chinese government also actually instructed a lot of internet companies to do self-censorship. So major social media companies hire a lot of censors to regulate speech on a daily basis. And they also rely on some kind of technology, for example, um, like big data science and also cloud computing to um, easily um, see which speech, what kind of speech is allowed and what should be censored. So, Apparently, companies actually played a major role in helping the Chinese government to um, execute censorship. 
within the Chinese corporate platforms, mm -hmm. what kind of speech is allowable and what's not? Um, so the Department of Propaganda at a central level, so the Propaganda Department is actually the key government agency in charge of censorship. They would provide these companies a list of um, not okay topics. So for example, that um, issue related to um, constitutionalism and also uh, civil society, these kind of issues are very sensitive right now, although these issues were be able, were able to be discussed in the past, like before 2013. And this government is especially tough, the mm -hmm. current leadership. Um, and this is more at um, the national, the central level. And at the local level, um, a lot of um, issues that could actually disturb social stability, for example, issues related to protest, demonstration, um, are not allowed. So if they actually see this kind of information, they would just uh, remove information from the internet or social media. And um, some Is this true of, of the situation in Taiwan or Hong Kong? They no, have more... Um, Taiwan is a very different situation because Taiwan um, already um, democrat, democrat, uh, dem democratized. Um, so it's, it's in effect more like the U.S. internet. Right, right. So, and Hong, Hong Kong, Kong has been, the situation in Hong Kong has been getting worse and worse over time especially in recent um, three years. According to Article 25 of the law, the Chinese state shall stop and punish unlawful and criminal activity on the Internet, such as cyber attacks, cyber theft, and dissemination of unlawful and harmful information. So one of the central questions you look mm -hmm. at in this book is the extent to which the Internet has either liberalized or not right. the Chinese sphere. Uh -huh. Um, what is the public outlook if you were to do a survey mm -hmm. of, um, you know, across socioeconomic lines mm -hmm. of China? Is the public outlook um, one that is um, concerned about the stymieing of, of open access? Is there a, is there a hunger for um, more access? I think it's really. Um, some people actually demand freedom of speech and freedom of information. Mm -hmm. And usually it's people with higher education level uh, tend to have this kind of demand. And um, I actually analyze some kind of um, nationally representative survey data and look at their political um, attitudes and also political behavior. And that's part and of how it. Has, how has the emergence of the internet mm -hmm. in China affected political right. behavior? Right. So I found that actually people who use um, internet more frequently tend to be more critical of the Chinese government and also tend to be more likely to participate in some kind of collective action like protests and strikes. And um, I think the reason is because they have access to more information and also social problems in China. And I interview people um, who don't use the internet and who use internet more frequently. And I found um, people who don't use the internet actually, um, for example, some like villagers, so they only know a lot of local problems. And they see um, the roots of problem. They see actually a lot of problems in China are caused by just like some individual people. It's not systematic. But for people who use internet more frequently, who have more access to information, they tend to really see um, the existence of some kind of systematic social problem in China. So they became more and more critical. And they also know more about what's happening outside of China. And they compare actually um, China and also other countries um, in many um, dimensions, for example, um, the operation of the core system and also media freedom. And actually many um, Chinese people care about these issues. So if they're not able mm -hmm. to tackle the systemic issue right. that you describe, mm -hmm. because those who do march in the streets or in mm -hmm. effect set up the mechanism online to protest. Is there a viable strategy right now uh -huh. for dissidents? In the past, um, I'm talking about a period between 2013 and 2014. So there was actually a golden um, period in terms of the development of the public sphere in China. At that time, the government was kind of was more 
relatively liberal. They crack down, but not crack down on such a like a large scale. And at that time, a lot of um, lawyers and also journalists developed some kind of strategy. So they tried to um, and they tried to use Weibo, which was one of the most popular social media in China, and to mobilize public support and to make some like small issue into like a big events, a contentious events that capture nationwide attention. So by by mobilizing public um, opinion, they can actually set some kind of public agenda. And in some situation, they did succeed. For example, they actually sometimes um, when they actually talk, I mean, disposed, um, exposed the misbehavior of government officials, the lo um, central government actually re remove certain government from their position because of um, the wrong because of their wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, um, these um, activists influence core decisions, and in some cases, they even influence lawmaking. But this is what happened in the past, just precisely because, I mean, this kind of strategy was so powerful. Um, in some situation, the current leadership feels very uncomfortable about um, the so consequences. What, I think our viewers would be interested mm. in what, what was the explanation for the, the crackdown? Okay, that's an excellent question. So, um, so the current government, so under the Xi leadership, um, see there is some kind of ideological problem. So he sees there is an ideological struggle between the West and China. And I think this is to some extent true. And um, so at least before 2014, many Chinese and many opinion leaders were kind of sympathetic to the ideas of liberal democracy. And for the Chinese, the current Chinese government, this is unacceptable because this is a totally um, kind of opposition you know, to the official ideology. So they do see there is a really, really serious, like really ideological crisis. And I did analyze um, the ideological orientation of top 100 public opinion leaders in China in 2015. So this is actually after 2013, so after the government initiated a series of um, crackdown. And I look at um, how they think about politics. So I classify the top 100 um, public opinion leaders. So usually they have like tens of millions of followers. So they are actually more influential than a lot of um, news, like news organizations. And um, so I classified them into three categories according to their political orientation. And the first ca category is political liberal. So who supports um, the notions of constitutionalism and also universal values? Um, by constitutionalism, I mean um, the government is supposed to be subject to the constitution. So this is kind of like basic idea people would agree. I mean outside of China, right? But then in China, the government doesn't like this idea. And also universal values uh, such as human rights. So I classify people who actually support these um, ideas mm -hmm. as um, political liberals and the people openly express their opposition to these ideas as political conservative. And opinion leader who actually don't express their view as um, like the other. So there's the third categories. Mm -hmm. And my analysis shows that 58% um, of the top 100 political, um, um, sorry, public opinion leaders are actually political liberals. And only 50% of the leaders are political conservative. And um, so the remaining are. Um, the neutral one, but actually I analyzed their connections, the connection between different um, political, uh, public opinion leaders, and I found the third category, category actually are closer to political um, liberal. So that's really alarming. So there's a majority. Right, so that's a majority, liberal. and can you imagine in a communist uh, authoritarian country, I mean, can a government really tolerate, I mean, there are a majority of public opinion who openly support the idea of like simple, I'm um, sympathetic to um, liberal democracy. That's kind of totally unacceptable to the Chinese government. And this list includes mm -hmm. p public opinion leaders, people who are both have online and 
journalistic personas, uh, so non-elected officials, right? So, so, this so is, these are the, are, so really I just um, appointed officials. select these people based on the numbers of their followers, so their influence, right. there are some kind of index calculating um, a person's influence on the internet, especially um, on Weibo, so one of the most popular social media in China. And so among the, these 100 people, the public opinion leaders, 30, around 30% 30 are media professionals. So because they have access to, they actually know the news and know the media very well, so they actually have a lot of followers. And um, only 6% of them are government officials. So actually the propaganda officials. So the Chinese government, they want to use um, some kind, they also want to use social media to promote their own official discourse. So they will have propaganda officials operating their own uh, accounts, social media account to attract. So what, uh, what's happened, attention. what's happened with the folks you've interviewed since the crackdown? Has, uh, has that a, number turned uh, uh, from uh, uh, majority I liberal so to majority conservative? I only analyzed data in 2015. That's actually already right. two years yes. after the crackdown. So, and um, so, but now the crack, crackdown actually um, focus on people with high centrality, high level of influence. Mm -hmm. So the government kind of effectively control the group who are the most uh, powerful in terms of um, facilitating the creation of contentious events. Is there a difference right now between journalistic mm -hmm. rights in the newspaper mm -hmm. industry, which is sometimes co-opted by state authorities, right, right and the the opportunity for free expression online. Mm -hmm. In the past, um, journalists had a better opportunity in um, writing something using their own social media. And for example, I mean, it's, um, so they actually do a lot of reports on a daily basis, but sometimes because of the censorship. So in each news organization, they have censors in their organization. So sometimes even they spend a lot of time doing a report the report was actually not allowed um, to be act to appear mm -hmm. in newspaper, and in this situation, sometimes um, journalists actually disclose the information online. So they actually um, they use their true identity to write something um, in, on the, the social media. So in the past, they are able to do this, but um, the government really just the Department of Propaganda realized this kind of strategy. So they actually. Um, kind of enacted a new law to regulate this kind of unprofessional behavior. And how has the Department of Propaganda mm -hmm. evolved since, if you look at the long picture of history since Tiananmen, mm -hmm. how, how has that body changed, mm -hmm. adapted to the new technologies? Oh, um, they really, really um, catch up with the recent development of technology. It sounds um, like it. Right, for example, um, they hire a lot of, or they ask a lot of different government agencies um, to hire something called public opinion analysts. And with the rise of um, public opinion in China, the Department of Government think it's uh, really important for them to be able to monitor and also analyze um, pu public opinion in a very precise way. So these people actually learn like big data science um, and uh, even they draw on artificial intelligence. So they really, really uh, want to really draw on technology to make um, censorship more efficient. Do you see in this country, mm. based on the current net neutrality debate, the same idea of the communist control and corporate mm. control in the sense that w once these rules have been revoked, which they have now, mm -hmm. corporations will have outsized influence mm -hmm. to potentially control how people use new media and if they even have access to it in the first place. And when you mention the villagers, mm -hmm. you know, there are a lot of people who are like the villagers here in the United States and mm -hmm. in, in, in rural and urban communities who don't have access. Honestly, I think the U.S. corporations really have very bad reputations. <laughs> and I think it's actually <laughs> is easily subject to a lot of outside influence, influence of money, influence mm -hmm. of power. And I think 
it's also a like international issue because nowadays the Chinese government actually influence a public opinion outside of China. And for example, in Australia, a, a lot of people actually receive um, money from Chinese business people. Um, so I think with um, the reveal of um, new, um, net neutrality, I guess everything could happen. So every like bad things, um, there could be a very, very negative consequences. Are the folks there able to have access to this? Um, I don't think so. And um, I, I think um, the book could not be translated into Chinese because this book cannot really, this book cannot pass censorship. And recently the Chinese government also began to censor academic journals. And um, so there is a very, very um, a, a top um, academic journals on China called China, China Quarterly, which is published by Cambridge University. Mm -hmm. And because these university presses want to do business with China, so recently the Chinese government asked Cambridge University to remove some of the articles from their database, um, their server in China. And in the beginning, um, Cambridge University agreed to remove all of these article and these articles are related to for example Tibet mm -hmm. and also um, Tiananmen sure. democratic movements so you can see there are academic institutes but when they have business interest I mean, in China it's really difficult really to um, expect that they would um, really honor their values. What does it say about the contentious public sphere that this book mm -hmm. would not be permitted, uh, would not be read um, it, I think your notion of a public sphere mm -hmm. uh, implies that there is some collective public good that's emerged, but it may be, maybe that conception has not been made yet. Um, my conception of a public sphere also um, is related to public discussion or public interests. Right. So actually in China's public sphere, many people actually discuss um, issues related to public good, public interest. For example, the protection of marginal groups in China. They're discussed, yeah. but they're, they're discussed in, to some extent, a vacuum without the access to the literature like your book. Um, so there's a... But it's very difficult to say because sometimes, I mean, Chinese students and Chi Chinese scholars actually translate mm -hmm. your work. Mm -hmm. So for example, I have an article um, talking about censorship of um, newspaper articles. And then when I was doing China, a field work in China two years ago, I realized actually they translate my, mm. my English article into Chinese. So by doing this kind of translation, people can see your work. But I think in terms of like a formal Right. publication is kind of impossible, but I still think there is some possibility that people can read right. your work. And also, nowadays, I mean, the higher education in China has been spending, so there are so many talented people who can read English right. literature. Well, I, isn't the key question, Professor, mm -hmm. whether or not the censored know they're being censored? In the sense that if you have a society where mm -hmm. folks are being censored mm -hmm. and they don't know they're being censored, they're not going to probe, they're not going to inquire, they're not going to ask mm -hmm. the questions. Right. So I get the impression from what you're saying that mm -hmm. they have, the, the Chinese people have enough access right now to that global perspective mm -hmm. to know that they are under threat. Mm -hmm. Their public discourse is stymied as a function of yeah, they know some degree of censorship, the question is whether that should be tolerated or how much of that should be tolerated. Yeah, the, I think, I mean, the majority of uh, netizens, which means internet users, know the existence of censorship. And, and in the past, in some kind of contentious events, people did request freedom of speech and have access to free information. They did try to push the government, but it's, it has been very, very difficult. And when they actually mobilize um, the whole entire um, security system, the state's um, apparatus to improve and maintain social stability, then what Chinese people can do is really, really limited. If you do discuss, you uh -huh. might disappear from the forum. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's, 
so that's the risk. Right. Huge so risk. yeah. So a lot of um, a lot of dissidents and also public opinion leaders usually use the f the word disappearance. Um, for example, there is uh, there was a big fire in Beijing um, recently, and 19 migrant worker died in the fire because th and they live in um, a very bad housing. And um, so after the fire, the Beijing government tried to evict these poor migrant workers and cut their heats because they they just think these people actually cause their problems. I mean, like having 19 people died in Beijing, not good for the government, right? And um, so there is an artist who actually um, reports, who went to these villages, um, to, I mean, the nearby Beijing, to actually record their protest every day. And then this person just talked about, okay, if you don't see me on YouTube, that means I disappear. So I mean, a lot of people have the fear of <laughs> disappearing. On that fearful thought, I yeah. want to thank you for joining me today, Professor. Mm -hmm. oh, the Contentious pleasure. Public Sphere out by Princeton University Press. Thank you. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash Open Mind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, the Angelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and to the corporate community Mutual of America.